I came across my first encounter with something beyond explanation during a camping trip to Foster Falls a few weeks ago in the South Cumberland State Park. My daughter 13 and I decided to do a short camping overnight trip to a walk-in primitive site about a two hike from the parking lot to the falls. Because it was the middle of the week, once we arrived at the small campground, unsurprisingly, I realized I was the only reservation out there. No biggie, pitched the tent, ditched the bags, and had a great day swimming at the falls and an uneventful evening by the fire. But we hit the hay once the sun went down. The following morning, I woke up at dawn, and my daughter and I roamed the other campsites looking for some firewood. There was a path down to the group site, so while heading about two minutes down the path, the trail curved and straight ahead in the dense brush, we heard rustling, and whatever we stumbled across quickly noticed us too. Just this massive white body as it took off. When we came across it, it made a high whining goat-like shriek, like it was startled. But it was fast, whatever it was had bone-white flesh, or if was fur or hair, it would have to be short and silky-like. Clear as day the sound of loud clomping of hooves, as it broke down the brush to get away from us. It then extended what looked like wings and no feathers like white large extended bat wings. Neither one of us got a good look at the front of the body it was hard to see, like I said it was not a clear view at all. But it seemed to lift off a little, but the entire time, we clearly heard what sounded like a horse running through the woods. Then, as quickly as it happened, it was gone. Just disappeared into the trees it was so quick and we were left dumbfounded that some huge white-winged thing that had hooves just charged through the forest. Just in daze for a few seconds and like, did you see what I just saw, look at one another, and then she said, was that a pegasus? At that point I knew I wasn't imagining things. Now I wouldn't say exactly say it had the body of a horse, it seemed taller, and not as wide. The body seemed more humanoid-like, but it was on all fours at least for a moment, before we noticed the wings expanding. I never got a look at the front. I'm still trying to make sense of it all. I never felt like we were in any danger, but yeah, not staying after that. I didn't want to freak my daughter out. But I packed up and got the hell out of there. Has anyone encountered cryptid stories like this in Tennessee, or in this neck of the woods with Appalachian lore? I feel silly even talking about this, but I know whatever it was, it did not match the description of a deer or anything I've ever seen. I've been in search and rescue now for several years. I've seen an interesting thing or two. From the moment I took this job, I knew it would be an experience. But out there taught me that there's always more to life than what you think. It made me appreciate the little things in life that I never really considered before. You see, searching for somebody can be one of the most frustrating challenges you can ever face. But at the same time, it can be one of the most rewarding experiences once you find them. One of the very first people that I had to go and look for was this child who had fallen off a small cliff. They must have been no older than six or seven. And while we found them alive, there were some very strange circumstances surrounding this kid's fall. First off, when we found him, he was still in relatively good spirits, having been missing for six hours. He suffered no more than a broken leg and a fractured rib. That kid was pretty tough for what had happened to him. But it's what he told us that really didn't make sense. See, he was roughly about 50 feet ahead of his family, when he explained to us that some large man pushed him off the side of the cliff. And although this could have been impossible, he was all by himself at least 50 or so feet away from his family, and there was nobody else next to him or around him. But his story never changes, even when questioned multiple times. He explains that a tall, large, bulky man in all black shoved him off the cliff and that's why he went tumbling. When we asked the parents and the family, 
they said that they looked up and just saw him almost lose his balance and fall. The kid's story never changes, even now. While he's cleared of having mental health issues, he seems genuinely frightened when he talks about seeing this man that shoved him. He also went on to say that this same large, dark man also followed him the entire time he was on this trail that led right around to the small cliff. But while that kid ended up fine and alive, there are other situations when I'm dealing with hikers who are unfortunately never found. I often hear about cases where people are never found with virtually no trace of them ever left. Search teams often bring out their dogs and aren't able to find any scent. It's as if they just vanished, disappeared into the woods, as if consumed by mother nature itself. Sometimes we find shoes or articles of clothing, but that's never guaranteed. And sometimes even our most trained search dogs just flat out lose their scent. How is that even possible? In fact, there was one time where one of my close colleagues saw something in the woods that changed their entire personality. This was a time when we were dispatched to help a woman who had gotten lost in the woods. We found her almost eight hours later near a creek. She was sitting on top of a rock and had been crying. When she saw us in the clearing coming towards her and yelling at her, she quickly told us to get out of there, that it was still around. While ignoring her pleaded cries, we came to her rescue and got her out of there, our whole team. Her physical appearance hadn't changed much, but she had been scratched up and dinged pretty good, almost as if she had been dragged through the woods, or so it looked like. When we asked her about what she meant by it, still being around, she wouldn't speak. She had been clearly very traumatized by someone or something. We can never exactly find out who or what. But the most we could get out of her is that something very large chased her into the woods and was apparently keeping her there, not allowing her to leave. Whatever it was apparently let us take her, which I don't exactly know what that was all about. Now, my colleague, whose personality was drastically changed by this experience, supposedly saw whatever it was, and she also refuses to speak about it at all. She won't even answer questions and just prefers to deal with her own business. After this case, she ended up going on leave for about two weeks. When she came back, she was totally different. It was like dealing with a trauma victim or something. So as you can see, we deal with all sorts of stuff on the job. Stuff that I don't always feel that we are equipped to handle. But that's beside the point. I took an oath when I took this job. And after doing this career for quite some time now, I never thought that this job would take my life to the places that it's at now. While it's given me so many opportunities to explore and expand my horizons, it's also made me appreciate the sanity and simplicity that life has given us, which we all sometimes take for granted. You know, they say you don't know what you have until it's gone, and I know that all too well. It's my job to not only protect the public, but other rangers as well. We have to protect our staff and each other. If they're not aware of what's going on, it's harder to get everybody on the same page. After all, we are a team. So my hope is that my fellow colleagues can be much more open about discussing strange things going on. I would love to see more transparency between fellow search and rescue officers and other rangers. Thank you for reading this story and please enjoy the rest of your day. If you wish to contact me about something directly related to what was written, feel free. And just remember that the following are some safety precautions that you may want to take if you plan on going into any national park. Make sure to always follow the instructions on signs. Don't enter prohibited areas. Don't feed or approach wildlife. Keep your pets under control at all times. Remember to tell somebody where you are going. Bring plenty of food, water and supplies, as well as a first aid kit and extra clothing layers in case it gets cold or wet. Always be aware of your surroundings and stay on the designated trails. Be careful out there and best of luck. My buddy works for the Boy Scouts and today he told me a story. 
He was hiking with his boss and the kids up the art lobe in North Carolina. He and his boss felt off about something and turned to look around. Both say they saw a thin, gray, mangy-looking monster on all fours take off across the trails and disappear. They brushed it off as a dying black bear with mange. Later though, when it got dark, they stopped at an old cabin. The kids slept inside, while my friend and his buddy were cowboy camping outside. He said they heard a bunch of sounds, and thinking it was a bear, looked up. When they looked up and turned on their flashlights, they saw the same creature but facing them. He said the monster had a human-like face, with the same thin gray body on all fours they had seen earlier. He's horrified, and refuses to go back to that cabin. Does anyone know anything about similar occurrences in the area? The image had been burned into my corneas, there's no why for me to forget what I'd witnessed that day. Not even the large amount of alcohol I've consumed can chase away those nightmarish images. It seems to have the opposite effect and makes me relive those moments. I was just a naive 20 year old. How was I supposed to know what lived in those woods? Evermore, how could I believe the tales the townspeople had whispered to their children at night? A beast so vicious and malevolent it's like something from a horror movie. It was years ago, I've taken it upon myself to visit an old friend, Harold, of mine from college. We'd planned to celebrate his promotion with a few days of staying at the Itasca State Park in Minnesota. We've rented a cabin and invited our other pals to join. It was rough getting all the preparations ready, but it felt good when our hard work paid off. Everyone was having a blast, Harold fired up the grill, we all conversed and said our congrats. Everything was going smoothly until night fell over the state park. It was odd to not hear any nocturnal animals out and about in the dark. It was even weirder when the crickets didn't make a sound. I laid in my bed and listened to the silence. A spark of anxiety and uneasiness settled in the pit of my stomach. The air felt like static. I caught a whiff of copper and the smell of hot garbage. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, my palms began to sweat and my body felt hot. A twig snapped just outside the small window of my room, I can hear ragged breathing as whatever was outside peered in through the window. I squeezed my eyes closed and laid as still as possible, the thing moved along the wall of the cabin. I can hear its heavy footsteps as it walked around the cabin. What the hell is that? I can hear the others in their rooms, my breath hitched in my throat as they turned on their lights. SHHH, it's just outside our bedroom window. Sarah, Harold's girlfriend, hushes him. I got worried that something might happen, so I climbed out of my bed and crept into their room. Both of them were looking out of the window. Sarah leaned back and pinched her nostrils closed, she gagged. Whatever it is, it smells like a landfill. Harold looked at Sarah and smiled. I know one thing, bears are known to smell like garbage. So, we can relax and go back to bed. Harold said, he looked at me and waved his hand at me. Don't you know how to knock, he laughed but it died out as soon as he realized that I wasn't paying him any attention. I stared right through him, and at the thing that was looking in through the window. It was massive, covered in dark long fur, and its eyes glowed in the light. I watched in horror as a massive hand tore right through the screen, and latched onto Harold's bicep. Sarah shrieked as the thing pulled her boyfriend right out the window, and into the night. We stared at the spot where Harold stood in shock. Call the ranger station. I told Sarah as I went to wake up the others. We sat in the living room of the cabin and waited for the park ranger to return. The sounds of crickets filled the silence as we waited and waited. In the distance I can hear the park ranger's ATV. A few minutes later the ranger came back to the cabin and shook his head. We'll organize a search and rescue team. For the time being would you explain to me what exactly happened? The park ranger looked at Sarah and I, 
we both shared a look. How are we supposed to tell this guy that Bigfoot just abducted our friend right before our own eyes? We didn't tell him the truth. We told him that Harold had snuck alcohol on the premises of the park, and had gotten so drunk that he climbed out of the window, and just wandered off. They never did find Harold, not a single thing except for a footprint that's too large for a human being. The Ojibwe believe that Bigfoot or Sasquatch, is a being that protects women and children. So, why did it attack Harold? Maybe Harold had planned to do something to his girlfriend that night, they didn't have the healthiest relationship. But, I know one thing for sure. I'll never go back to Itasca State Park, and I'll be sure to know who I'm friends with. I don't want to be associated with someone that can do horrible things to their friends and family. Just the thought of being friends with him makes my blood boil, who knew Harold was such a rotten person. The guilt eats away at me, I was the one who introduced the two. No matter how much alcohol I consume, I can still see his twisted face. This Saturday, my two good friends and I were hanging out. Every time we are together, we like to go for drives at night along this one road. Sometimes we stop by some local parks and walk around, just talking or messing around. This time, we decided to stop by a field where we planned to kick a soccer ball around. It was around 2 a.m., and the area seemed pretty dead, except for the occasional passing car or ranger closing the park. When we arrived at the field, we noticed a newly built playground, and thought it would be cool to mess around on it. First, I parked the car and faced the high beams towards the field, leaving it running so we could see what we were doing. Then we got out and started passing around the soccer ball, enjoying the weird vibes and having a loud conversation. After a bit, we got bored and decided to go on the playground. I reparked the car so the high beams were facing it. Once again, we got out and started heading towards it. The playground consisted of a large, castle-like structure in the middle, surrounded by balance obstacles, balance beams, wavy bridges, etc. We headed towards the main castle, taking our time, strolling on the obstacles, and again enjoying the effect the high beams had on the environment. Looking back at the car, all I could see were our silhouettes. If you looked at the playground, our figures cast long, pitch black shadows on the castle, adding a feeling that parts of the castle were shrouded and hidden. As I took one more step closer to the castle however, these feelings of excitement and mild spookiness were slightly tarnished. I was hit with the smell of a cigarette, as if someone was smoking one just in front of me. Not realizing the implications, I called out to one of my friends and told them I smelled a cigarette. They said they didn't and stepped closer. They smelled it too. Part joking and part serious I said, what if there's someone over there smoking a cigarette? Being the skittish and on edge kids we were, we ran back to the car, laughing and joking. Once we sat down in the car, my friend suggested we drive around and scan the playground for anyone there, as we were now extremely curious. I took the car and drove it in a circle, then back around, sweeping from the right side of the playground to the left, exposing nothing. We then realized we had left the soccer ball in the field, so I drove the car into the field, and my friend stepped out and grabbed it. After this, we decided to do one last sweep, and then get the hell out of there, as we were kind of spooked at this point. I scanned the playground with the high beams one last time, then stopped the car facing the playground. We sat there for around 15 seconds on our phones, about to drive off, when it happened. My friend sitting in the back seat was the first to see it, starting to say something like, Do you guys see the? And then I looked up. Underneath the wooden beams of the now ominous castle, we saw a shape, a blurry red circle with a white center, moving as if it were a person. I know that doesn't make sense, but that's all I can say. It appeared as if it started from the back of the castle, and was moving in a creature-like manner towards the front of the castle, towards us. 
In this split second of silence as we watched this, I unconsciously slammed the car into reverse and quickly spun 180 degrees. Remembering that moment, I have never felt that much fear in my entire life. Something about the way that thing was moving made me feel so unbelievably petrified, my stomach felt like it was thrown off a cliff, and my hair stood straight like a bed of nails. All three of us were now screaming, and I quickly and sloppily drove away. We had all seen the exact same thing. We drove away and began to calm down a little, wondering what the f that thing was. I assumed it was probably some homeless person who had gone under the playground for a smoke or something. To be sure, we decided we would drive past again and try to get a better look at the playground, maybe seeing that what we had seen was some part of the playground, or maybe catching the person who had walked out from under the castle in better light. As we came nearer to the playground, the tension began rising again, and I began to pull into the road connected to the parking lot. As I turned, my beams glanced over the playground for a second, and then over the road. On the side of the road walked a man. He was dressed in a full sweat clothing outfit, with his hood over a baseball hat, and a Swiss army backpack. I quickly sped by him, and we felt as though we may have gotten our answer. We kept driving for a few seconds, then realized we had not seen any red on him. It was all white. I decided to turn back around and get a better look at this man to get some closure. When I went back on the same road, he was not there anymore. I assumed he ducked into the woods or something, so I kept going back towards my friend's house, deciding to return home. Taking the turn back onto the main road though, we saw him again. This time he was walking in the complete opposite direction, unrealistically far from where we first saw him, again with his back to us. This was the cherry of weirdness on top, and we drove back home in a state of excited terror. The one thing we couldn't stop repeating was the fact that whatever or whoever that was had been there the whole time. Under the castle, simply watching and listening to us. If I had simply ignored the cigarette smoke and gone on the castle, they would have been under us, just observing. I could have easily made this story sound much more than it was by adding the detail that the playground was built to memorialize a boy who was killed in a horrific lawnmower accident, but I don't think that would properly portray what we experienced. I have no idea what we saw, and when we got back to my friend's house, we started analyzing photos of the playground from different angles, trying to see if there was something that looked like what we saw, but we couldn't find anything. Look up, Jack's Place Playground on Google Maps to find the playground. First let me give you the basic rundown that way you know what's going on, and why this scared us so bad. This was last month June 2016. There were four people on this trip. Two couples. We were in two tents one medium size and one large one. The tents were catty cornered at the two corners side corners of the group spot. They were almost facing each other. We were at the group site that was farther away from the rest of the campground. This was our second trip to the same campground, and my thousand trip to this campground, I've been going to this campground since I was little. Also I'm shit at writing so please forgive me. Okay, on to the story. We were on a three-night trip Saturday-Tuesday at my favorite campground, Roan Mountain State Park. This campground is my favorite because of it being safe. Well, I thought it was safe. We had went there about a month prior, and at night we would hear footsteps around the tents on that trip. We had one extra tent, but I just blamed it on deer and raccoons looking for food. Because we didn't think much of the footsteps, we ignored them the first night of the second trip. But the next night shit got weird. We had all went into our tents for the night. I had fallen asleep for a while and woke up for a bit. I was facing my boyfriend. My back to the other tent and his back to the small creek. I was just looking around completely relaxed until I saw a flashlight on the back of the tent. I chalked it up that some idiot was walking the small trail that starts and ends on our side of the creek. 
I kept watching it, and it lasted for a solid minute of the light, moving around the corner of our tent. I woke up my boyfriend to watch it with me. Eventually I got up completely naked, and turned on the lantern we had hanging in the top of the tent. I stood there, and the light stopped. I did this kind of as a test. If it was a ranger or someone hiking around they'd stop, and not do it again. I got dressed and turned the light back out. About 5 minutes later it started again. This time with footsteps near our tent. I got stressed and asked my boyfriend to ask our guy friend in the other tent if it was him. He was asleep, but his girlfriend I'll call her M wasn't. She'd been watching it the whole time thinking it was us. We all got up to leave our tents and the light didn't stop until the first person got out. We searched around with lanterns, shitty flashlights, cheap pocket knives, and the pepper spray I keep on my keychain. We saw and heard nothing. It was so quiet, the only sound was the constant splash of the creek. We started a fairly large fire and tried to figure out what happened. M said she was almost asleep when she saw the light. She said it was coming from the start of the road to the group spots but the one I saw was coming from the bridge that crosses the creek. Both of us said the light had shadows of branches. We never saw anyone leave the trail. It's a short circle. We have no clue who the people were and where they went. We knew it wasn't the ranger because they drive down the gravel road on their rounds and their rounds end at about 11. We knew it wasn't some shitty kid because it was 2, 3 AM. And we knew it wasn't someone older because they'd apologize, that's just the normal thing that has always been done. It makes it stranger because the night before there was a large group of boy scouts at the first group spot. I'm talking like 20 tents on one spot big, and none of them did anything like that. Nothing strange happened on the next day and night of the trip. We kind of just pushed the event out of our minds and pretended it never happened. This may not seem really scary, but in the moment it was terrifying. Hope you all enjoyed. Thank you for reading. Hi, I won't be using my real name for privacy reasons, but I will say I am a 15 year old female. I'm from Nebraska. I know you are probably thinking cornfields and the middle of nowhere, but that's not where I'm from. I live in Omaha. Despite living in the city, I have always loved the outdoors. I go hunting and hiking almost every weekend with my dad or with friends. Okay, on to the story. This story is 100% true. I went to Nebraska National Forest every long weekend with two of my friends who I'll call Halle and Todd. I have known them for years, and we would never hike alone because of the risks. So we became a group. Anyways, it was spring break last year when we went on a week-long backpacking trip. It was a 7-hour drive there. I, being 14, couldn't drive, but Hallie was 16 and Todd 15. Hallie drove us there, and we had a great time for the first few hours of the drive. But as we got closer to the forest, something felt off. I know it sounds cliché, but I had this feeling like I was going to get sick. I ignored it and thought I was just nervous. Hallie and Todd noticed that I was off. They asked me what was up, and when I told them something wasn't right, they laughed, thinking I was trying to scare them. A few hours later, and the feeling was still there, but we were at the trailhead. I got out, and everything was as it should be. We grabbed our packs, and off we went. I felt like I was at home in the trees, and the feeling was soon forgotten. We walked a little over 5 miles that day before we set up camp. We had a two-person tent that Hallie and I had brought and a hammock Todd had bought. After we set up camp, ate, and were just chilling by the fire talking there wasn't any alcohol or drugs, Todd began complaining about how he didn't want to sleep in his hammock. I didn't want to listen to him complaining and offered to switch places. He gladly accepted. So the night went on like usual until around 2 AM when we all got tired and went to bed. Well, everyone but me. I have extremely bad insomnia, so I was just tending to the fire and chilling. 
Finally, I decided to get into the hammock and read. So I put out the fire, grabbed my headlamp, and got into the hammock. I noticed that something was off, but I couldn't place what it was. That's when it hit me, it was completely silent in the woods. No crickets, no animals, nothing. My skin started to crawl, something was off. I turned off my headlamp, laid down, and kept silent. I wanted to try and hear some type of animal to ease my worries. That's when I heard it. Something was dragging against the tent. I wasn't even five feet from the tent. It freaked me out, and I did something really stupid. I called out my friend's names. The noise stopped. I got no answer, but this feeling of dread was something I hadn't felt before or since. That's when I felt it. Something poked the hammock. It wasn't a soft poke, it was like a jab. I was horrified. What the hell had just touched me, and where the hell was it? I was frozen. I also suffer from anxiety, and I felt the panic rising in me. I couldn't understand what was going on. That's when I made another mistake. I decided I wanted to see what had just jabbed me. All this happened within seconds. I reached up and clicked on my light. That's when I saw it. It was out of my nightmares. There was a creature about four feet above me staring at me, kind of hunched over. I was about three feet off the ground, so this thing was probably seven eight feet tall. It looked like a dog, but it also didn't. It had the face of a wolf, but human in a way, the eyes looked red, the ears looked like clipped pit bull ears, its mouth pulled back in a snarl, and a hand claw, paw thing blocking its face. I was terrified. Its teeth were huge and sharp, the paws, if you could even call them that, had five finger type things with sharp, long claws that looked like they could tear me apart. I stared at this thing for what felt like hours, but it was only probably five seconds. That's when I screamed bloody murder. As soon as I did that, this thing let out something between a scream and a howl. It was deep, and I could feel it. That's when I heard Todd yell. What the hell was that? I heard the tent opening, and that's when the creature and I finally broke eye contact. I yelled at Hallie and Todd to help me. I looked back up, and this thing was climbing the freaking tree. It was still staring at me. That's when I saw the back of it. It had the tail of a dog, grayish silver fur, a black mane down its back, and a hump. I took this opportunity to scramble out of my hammock. We took off without grabbing anything. I had no shoes, nothing. We made it to the car. But the whole time back, I heard something in the trees. The next day, we had park rangers go get our things as we were freaked out. When they got there, everything was gone. Not even trash remained. It was as if we were never there. They blamed us for lying. We had no idea what had happened. I had no idea what I saw or why it didn't just kill me. I haven't been back in the woods for a very long time, but still, every time I close my eyes, I see that thing and hear its roar. So I thought I'd go ahead and share another encounter that seriously put me on edge and made me question everything that happened that night. I was in my sophomore year of high school. At the time, a family friend, who shall be called Alan, was living with us. He was down on his luck and needed a place to crash for a month until he shipped off for the army. He was around 21 and I was around 15. My buddy Jake decided to come spend the weekend with us one time in the summer, since he and Alan got along great, and I actually wanted to be part of a group for once. So, I invited him over to chill. He was a freshman at the time. We were at my house in rural Florida, and got the idea to sneak out that Friday night, and head up to a forest not too far up the road. There was a library, and behind that library was a good 100 acres of preserved woodlands that had pathways carved through it, meant to be somewhat of an educational attraction for the guests of the library. We saw it as a place to make a bomb-ass fort in the woods. We decided to bring some tools, 
hammers, nails, saws, and even a pair of bolt cutters to cut a section of chain fence and use that as a roof for the fort. We were very optimistic at this time. We loaded everything up and headed out. The best way to get to the forest from my house was to walk down this little section of road and climb up a small sand dune that the road carved through. On top of that nearly 50 degree incline, a good two stories up, was a fence. We cut the fence with the bolt cutters, let ourselves in, and found a good place to set up camp. We were there for a good 30 minutes, dragging around loose branches and making a ruckus when Alan decided to start on the roof. Jake decided to stay back at the fort while Alan and I went to get a section of the fence. We got back to the part we cut open to get in, and as we were cutting the rest of it out, we both looked over the fence line, down the sand dune, to see an old white van parked off the road, facing us, with its lights on. Two hooded figures and a dog were standing next to it. Alan and I dropped the cutters and ran as fast as we could to the fort. Me, being an out of shape asthmatic kid, and him, being ready for the rangers, quickly left me in the dust. I was running for what seemed like an eternity before a hand reached out from the sticks and pulled me in. It was Alan. He threw me down to the ground next to Jake, and all of us laid prone in the sand, not making a sound. We heard the sound of footsteps shuffling through the sandy path by our fort, and as they got closer, we all heard a low, raspy breathing. Whoever was running was either old, a smoker, out of shape, or any combination of the three. I started wheezing right as the figure walked past us. Alan motioned for me to use my inhaler in my pocket. I did, and as the device puffed, the footsteps stopped. It felt like we were laying there for hours after that, but when the steps picked back up, we realized they only stopped for a second or two. When the footsteps left, we all whispered to each other what to do. Alan decided to be the man and give himself over to whoever those men were. His logic was since the city courthouse was literally an eighth of a mile down the road, he could run there if there was trouble. Judging by the shape of the person following us, it didn't seem like he'd have any problems outrunning them. So, we broke up. Alan decided to run out to the main fence and head left towards the opening and the van, while Jake and I ran a good hundred feet to the right, and hopped the fence into the tree line on the side of the road. We counted down, and in a flurry, we all hauled ass. I've never run that fast in my life. Everything was a blur. I looked back at Alan before he crested the sand dune, our knight in camo armor, willingly confronting would-be attackers to let two kids run for safety. Jake and I were running down this sandy path next to the fence when we heard the same breathing from earlier, and out of the corner of our eyes, coming from a path that led right to the one we were on, stood a very large man who let out a grunt when he saw us. We literally ran right past him on our right, and kept running, faster than ever. We crested another dune and decided to jump the fence when the man couldn't possibly see us. We vaulted clean over into the bushes. We hid in the bushes and tree line next to the road, as we saw the very large man run past us on the other side of the fence on the path. He ran right past us. We were amazed our hiding spot worked. It was as if I could hear every one of his bronchial tubes wheeze as he shuffled past. We held our breaths for any other sounds. Just then, a voice on the other side, near the side of the roadway said, It's okay boys. Come on out. You're safe. We both looked in horror as a dark figure stood in the moonlight, standing on the highway, looking right at us. It took us a second, but we realized it was actually Alan. Somehow managing to run up the pathway a good way, confront a madman, then casually walk down the road at least 200 feet to where we were. If that didn't make us feel out of shape, I don't know what will. We walked out and were smiling so big our cheeks hurt. We were finally out of that mess. We asked him what happened with the guys at the van. It turns out the county sheriff uses that stretch of road to train new K-9 units. Hence the old van with Zai's County Sheriff lettered on the side, we somehow failed to notice, and the dog we saw. 
We were thrilled and walked home. We felt invincible. We saw the same white van drive past us as we were walking into a gas station parking lot to grab drinks. The officers waved at us, and we waved back. We made it home safe and sound. We all huddled into my garage, blasting music, and eating all kinds of junk food. We joked about the events that just happened when I realized something. I asked Alan how many people he saw when we first looked over the fence at the van. He said he saw two men and a dog, I agreed. I then asked him how many people he saw when he walked down to greet them. He said two men and a dog. I asked if the van had all its seats in. He said the sliding door was wide open, and the interior lights were on. It only had the front two seats, and the back had a bunch of towels and carpet for the dog or something, along with some cases of what he assumed were full of toys to train the dog with. I could feel my stomach sink and asked him in a broken voice. If it was only those two men, and neither of them walked away from the van, who the F chased us through the woods. All three of us stared at each other, not having an answer to that question. So I'm not sure where to post this. I've never heard of a white fluffy creature like what I saw, but here I am in case you all know something that sounds familiar, or have ideas of what it could have been. My dad and I were driving back to Bend, Oregon from a short trip to Portland. It was probably around 3 a.m., and we were maybe 20 minutes from home. We were going down the highway pretty fast. My dad is a terrifyingly fast driver, and cannot be stopped. It was winter time, and the forest was on both sides of the road with tall pine trees. Off to my right, I see something zooming towards our Chevy Tahoe. We were going fast, and that thing must have been going as fast or faster. I braced for impact. It was all happening so fast, I didn't have time to say anything except ooh. And I saw that it was white, very round literally couldn't see a head or legs or arms or anything except long white fluffy hair in a big ball shape, and it was almost as tall as the hood of the vehicle. So it almost hit us, and then stopped on a dime. We drove past it. I whipped my head around and saw it run between us and the car behind us. Their lights illuminated it as it ran all the way across the highway to the other side. I looked back at my dad, very stunned, and he said, did you see that? And I said, yeah, and he said, was it white, and fluffy, and round, and I said, yes. We talked about it the rest of the way home, trying to figure out what it might have been. We've asked other people, and they always look at us like we're crazy. It wasn't anything I can think of that I've ever seen not a goat, sheep, big dog, or a polar bear. It wasn't a big snowball. The fur had to have been super thick and long, with zero other defining features. Just a huge white fluffy ball zooming at super high speeds through the woods, conscious enough to come to a full stop to avoid hitting us then continue its journey across the highway and back into the woods. I'd like to start out by saying that I want this story to be a learning experience for those of you out there that are about to embark on your independence. If you are about to move away from home for the first time, then you will have a lot of curiosities about the world you are just now starting to experience. Everything will feel different, strange, exciting, and maybe even scary. Believe me when I say that I have always been a cautious person, even in my rebellious teenage years. I always thought that nothing traumatizing could ever happen to me, because I am intelligent, cautious, and always make the right choices. Well, even though having these traits should help you on your journey in life, you can never be prepared for the unexpected because even I have made stupid mistakes that seemed like the right choice at the time. But looking back now, I don't understand how I didn't see what was coming. This experience took place in my college years between 27 and 2010. My name is Derek, and I grew up in a small town in Oregon called Canyon City. It was a beautiful town right outside of Malhor National Forest, 
and the population was roughly 680 people back then. I lived out in the country for most of my childhood a few miles outside of town really close to the national forest. I was never able to have very many friends because I lived so far away from everyone who I went to school with. But I learned to love playing in the forest around my house with my little brother Brian, and I found myself happy with what I had. I knew I wanted to stay in the woods my whole life because it's what I grew up with. So that's why when I graduated high school in 27, I decided I wanted to study environmental science and become a forest ranger. The college that I was looking at going to was Central Washington University, and although that meant I would have to move away from the area I loved, it had a really good program for what I wanted. After touring the school however, I learned that the entire town is surrounded by wildlife parks and forests, and a lot of outdoor activities, which made me feel better about going there. However, I was warned that a lot of people have gone missing in the woods around this town as it's easy to get lost. It has gotten really bad within the last 10 years though. Unfortunately, most of them never turn back up. The population of this town, which is called Ellensburg, Washington, was about 20,000 people and felt like a really big change for me. However, growing up without friends I figured I'd have more opportunities in a big town like this one to find people with similar interests as me. After my first few weeks of school, I learned that most of the people who went to this school went here for the outdoor and environment programs just like I did, which meant that we all had a lot in common and a shared love for the outdoors and nature. However, I quickly realized after socializing and hanging out with a few people, I went to class with that a lot of people at this university were also big partiers. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for a bunch of drunk college kids to go out camping in the middle of the woods outside of town, and never find their way back. I never had to worry about that however, because I definitely was not a partier. I should also say that I grew up in a very strict Christian family, which kind of made me stay away from parties, and such while I attended university. So after my first month or so at college, I still found myself without a single friend. My roommate at the time was also a very heavy partier, and he invited me to parties all the time when we first met, but quickly realized that his lifestyle was very different from mine. Although we didn't really talk much, I do have to give him credit for actually trying with me a lot. He is the reason I found my good friend Alex. My roommate heard of a social gathering in the gymnasium going on one weekend where the individual university groups and clubs would gather behind their own booths to try and recruit new members. After hearing about this, I figured I had nothing better going on in my life at the moment, so I headed on over to the gymnasium in hopes of finding an outdoor club or something that would interest me. I found myself in disappointment for a while. There were a lot of clubs and groups that were mainly for outdoor and nature lovers like me, but I always lost my interest once that started talking about partying or drinking during their excursions. I went to about four or five different booths where it was all the same story. I soon realized that there was one kid about my age going to all of the same booths as I was, and then leaving in disappointment. While looking for more groups, I felt someone tap on my shoulder, and sure enough it was the kid who had been following me to the same booths. Can't find anything either huh? He asked. Nah, not really anything for me here I guess. There's always too much partying involved for my taste, I replied. He giggled a little bit before saying, You must be a raised Christian too, I bet. You got me there, I said with a smile. We started talking a bit about ourselves. He introduced himself as Alex, and we began to realize our similar interests, and what exactly we were looking for in a group. We also began to talk about forgetting about joining any of these groups, and having our own fun, until we were interrupted by someone who must have been listening to our entire conversation. I know just what you guys need. We both turned around to find a really tall and strong looking guy who had dark black hair and dark blue eyes looking down at us. He had a very bright white small and appeared to be a very charismatic guy. 
You guys are exactly what we look for in my group. People who love Jesus as much as they love the outdoors. Being the Christians that we are Alex, and I both seemed intrigued immediately. I take it with those looks I'm getting that I'm right on the money with this one, aren't I? The man asked. Well now we're getting somewhere, Alex replied. The man introduced himself as Dustin, and he walked us over to a booth way in the back corner of the gym where a few other guys stood around chatting. The sign on the booth read, Amor Creationis. Dustin must have seen our confused faces while reading the sign. It means love of creation, he said. We all love the beautiful nature in this world that God created, and we love God as well. Now with that summary of the group in mind, I knew this is exactly what I had been looking for my entire life. Looking at Alex, I could tell he felt the same. We eagerly signed some papers and read some pamphlets in order to become official members of the group. Never had I felt so happy to be a part of something in my life. It was the first time I had ever felt accepted, and everyone I met in this group felt like my close friend. In the early days of being an Amor creationist, everything felt normal, and it was all fun. We went on nature walks, went kayaking, zip lining, and did almost every single outdoor activity, you can think of within my first month of being in the group. There were about 40 of us in total in this group. The leader of the group was named Zach. He was much older than us, but it wasn't weird or anything because he started the group back in 1999 with his best friend Danny, who was also still in the group. I guess the success of Amor Creationists with outdoor loving Christians was so big that they decided to stick around for us college kids. For that reason, we all respected Zach for what he had done for us, and what he had created. Everything seemed fine for the first couple of years of college. I studied a lot for my classes, had a part-time job, and three times a week I would meet with my group mates somewhere out in the forest, and we would do different activities. Things started to change in the fall of 2009 however. Now that Alex and I had been in Amor Creationists for a few years now, we were considered loyal followers of the Lord's creations as Zach and Danny called it. It wasn't unusual for Zach to expect more out of the upperclassmen in the group. They always went on extra excursions and met a few more times a week than the rest of the underclassmen. Now what they did with their extra time together Alex and I never knew. We were always just told that once you had put in enough time with the group that you would be allowed extra privileges. Until the time came for Alex and I to earn our extra privileges, we never really cared about what those privileges were. At the start of our junior year, Zach and Danny called Alex, me, and a few other juniors who had spent the last couple of years in the group, to a meeting. We were told the time had arrived for us to be considered loyal to the group, and we could now earn our extra privileges. Dustin, who was the guy who recruited Alex and I, was also there. He was handing us all Bibles, crosses to wear around our necks, and purple stoles with crosses on them to also wear around our necks. Meanwhile, Danny was lighting candles around a cross that they must have made from wood and staked in the ground between two trees. Zach started off the meeting by saying something like, Hello followers. The time has come to learn and understand the true meaning of Christianity. Tonight, you shall be one with the Lord. Alex and I kind of glanced at each other with smiles on our faces, thinking that Zach was just being funny. As it turns out, Zach was not kidding. He began to list out names of supposed atheists that lived in town or went to college. He even had pictures of them too. Before I got too weirded out by what was going on, Zach said. Now it is our duty to attempt to show these guys the beauty of the world as we see it. How do you do this you may be asking yourselves. I have assigned each one of you an atheist to convert. It's simple, all you have to do is get them to come to our meeting next week, Danny and I can take care of the rest. Now the way he said all of that kind of made me get a little sick in my stomach. But I had known these guys for two years now and I knew they always meant well. 
What was the big deal if they just wanted to do their Christian duty and try and spread the word? Now apparently Alex had different thoughts than I did. While everyone was packing up from the meeting, he stopped me before I could head out, and he seemed really uncomfortable, and he was also shaking. What the hell is going on here, he asked. What do you mean, I replied. Do you not see what is going on? The stoles, the candles, the crosses. This is starting to feel like a cult to me man. Alex was really trembling now. I just told him he was overthinking everything, and there wasn't anything wrong with what we were doing. But before we could finish talking, Danny came by to see what was going on. He had a very sinister look on his face. Alex hurried up to reply and said, Nothing Danny, we were just discussing one of out classes that we take together. I looked at Alex strangely as I planned on having Danny explain to him that there was nothing to be worried about. But I had a feeling that with a sinister look on Danny's face that that may no longer be the case. I brushed if off though and headed back to campus. Now a few days had passed and I hadn't heard from Alex. I thought we were going to plan on recruiting our assigned atheists together, but I figured he had made other arrangements. I had forgotten all about our run-in with Danny the other night until someone started knocking frantically on the door to my dorm at 1 o'clock in the morning. Looking through the peak hole, I saw it was Alex. He had his eyes full of tears, and he was standing in a really weird position. He was looking side to side really fast as if he was trying to look for someone. In a panic, I opened up the door and Alex practically ran me over as he stumbled in. He was breathing very hard and said, God man, you have to help me. Before I could ask him what was wrong, he lifted up his shirt and showed me his back. There were deep red marks on his back with blood dripping out of them. It looked as if he had been whipped. He started crying as he explained what happened. Apparently Danny, Zach, and Dustin had been hiding in the bushes along a trail that Alex runs on every evening. They grabbed him and drug him in the woods behind the trail, and whipped him for calling Amor Creation as a cult. They told him not to tell anyone about the encounter, and that he'd better have his atheist with him that week, or else. Now I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but the whiplashes proved it all. I rubbed some Neosporin on all of his lashes, hoping it would help, and then I told him I was calling the police. He quickly stopped me telling me how bad of an idea that was, and that Zach also warned him about the ramifications if he were to call the cops. Alex said that he didn't know what the ramifications would be, but the way Zach said it made him never want to find out. What's the plan then? I asked. I guess we just find our assigned atheist, get them to come to our meeting, stick it out until graduation, and then forget the whole thing ever happened, because I do not want to go through this ever again. He said as he tried to keep the tears from falling down his cheek. I really felt sorry for Alex and scared at the same time, because after knowing all of these guys for a couple years, it came as a real shocker. They were all the most charismatic people I had ever met. I guess that's why they could trick a couple of kids like us into joining them in their so-called group which I now I was beginning to associate with a cult. Thinking of myself being in a cult was chilling me to my bones, because I have heard stories of what happens when you try and leave a cult, and now I couldn't wait for graduation. Now the day had come for the much anticipated meeting. It was a struggle for Alex and I to get our atheists to come to the meeting, but Zach also said there would be free food and fun activities for them. So once we threw in those details to our speeches, they were convinced. Now Zach had directed us to tell the atheist to meet at the certain spot 15 minutes before any of us got there, which seemed weird to us. But after what Alex had gone through, I think we were both done questioning stuff for the time being. Now this next part of the story is why I warned all of you in the beginning to be careful and cautious when you first go out into the real world on your own. You never know who you'll meet, who to trust, or what people are capable of. And let me tell you, I struggle with trust issues now because of what happens next, and it still haunts me to this day. Upon our arrival I had a very sick sense in my stomach. 
I'm not sure what it was about the forest that day, but it all seemed a little dark and moody to me. We walked off trail to the location Zach had told us to meet, and as we inched closer to the site, Alex and I stopped dead in our tracks. Great job you guys, Zach said with his bright smile. I didn't think either of you had it in you, but you got us those atheists and look now, they are converted. I felt sick to my stomach. I looked at Alex and saw in his face the most fear which one could ever express through their eyes. I looked back at the hell that was before me, and I remember feeling my heart in my throat, unable to say a word or think a thought. The atheists that had been instructed to meet at this site just 15 minutes before us were all had towels over their mouths, and were hung on crosses imitating Jesus hanging on the crucifix. Alex threw up right beside me. Oh relax, said Danny, they're only tied to the, the crosses with ropes. What the hell guys, screamed Alex. Why would you think any of this is okay? You all are sick and cruel and definitely are the opposite of what I consider a Christian. My stomach flipped as I saw all Zach's, Danny's and Dustin's reactions to Alex's statement. I could tell he made the wrong choice of words and the next thing I knew, Danny and Dustin started chasing Alex through the woods. Everything that was going on seemed blurry to me as it all happened so fast. In the middle of it all, one of the kids that were tied to the cross somehow got loose and ran off as fast as they could. Zach hurried up and tackled the kid and the next thing I knew, he grabs a rock off of the ground and unalives him. I immediately vomited and a few of the other members there with Alex and I that night ran off. Suddenly, one of the older guys tied up to the cross started to vomit, and since they had a towel tied to their mouth, they started choking. I rushed over to help the guy, but then I heard, let him suffer, let him die. It's his own fault for not having faith in the Lord. Zach was walking toward me with blood all over his face. The face that I once knew to be so kind and friendly and full of charisma was now bloody and full of evil. I slowly backed away from him. It was only me, Zach, the man choking to death, and two other men tied up to the crosses left at the scene now. Now, continued Zach, what do you say we go gather up those weasels who took off from our ceremony and get them back to finish what we started? Stuttering, I said, oh, okay. I'll go find your friend and you find the rest of the guys. Got it, he said in a stern voice. I waited for him to disappear and made sure it looked like I was walking in the direction that everyone else ran. I then rushed back and untied both men from the crosses. They both looked at me in relief and in fear. What the hell are we doing here? One man yelled, I'm calling the police. Good luck getting any service, the other man replied. While he tried to call the police, I examined the man who choked to death on his own vomit and the other kid laying on the ground with his head smashed in. I began freaking out on what I had done. I don't really remember much of what else happened that night. I did have to talk to the police, and they searched for everyone lost in the woods, the following couple of days. They found Alex and all of the other guys who arrived with me that night. They also found Danny a few weeks later, but he was already dead when they found him. They caught Dustin as well, and I know he was arrested, and is still in jail to this day. However, Zach has never been found or heard from again. After Amor Creationists disbanded, there were never any disappearances in those woods ever again. Now Dustin never confessed, but I believe they were the cause of those disappearances for the last 10 years. Who knows how many atheists they have abducted, or what else has gone on in those woods. I stayed in contact with Alex for quite a while afterwards, and we both still have nightmares to this day about Zack finding us to get his revenge. Being out in the woods has never been the same since that day, especially by myself. And like I said, I still struggle with trust issues to this day. You just never know who anybody can really be, or what they might be capable of. I hike a lot, and this past winter, I saw footprints I couldn't explain. I live in Arizona, 
not far from the Navajo reservation. I am Navajo. In the middle of nowhere, there are ruins of an abandoned house. There is no roof, just adobe walls, a dried up old well, and a dilapidated travel trailer. Somebody broke into the travel trailer long ago, and pack rats built nests inside the trailer. I've never been inside the trailer because I avoid mouse droppings due to Hanavirus fears. I use the abandoned house and travel trailer as landmarks in my hikes. So this past winter, I went on a hike. At the abandoned homestead, I saw the footprints of a small child, no adults, nothing else. The footprints were 5 inches long and 3 inches wide, and they looked like the soles of sneakers or something a child would wear. I also saw evidence that the child dug around inside the travel trailer, taking out things from within. There was a hodgepodge of household items lined up neatly in a row. Steel skillet, hammer, roofing nails, old Coleman fuel containers, old-fashioned glass bottles, etc. Wondering if I was seeing the tracks of a runaway or lost child, I decided to track the footprints. The tracks led away from the homestead, across the plains, and up the side of a mesa. Three miles away, the tracks intersected a dirt road. At the dirt road, I found tire tracks from a car. The car was parked parallel to the dirt road. The child's footprints walked to the driver's side of the car and got in. The car tracks then did a three-point turn and headed back in the opposite direction. Confused about the tracks, I visited my elder. I relayed my story, and my elder offered an explanation. He told me I tracked a skinwalker. He also told me they have the ability to make their bodies and footprints small. He told me a story of how the magic works. He said the skinwalker was probably looking for something inside the ruins. Update. So recently, I tracked two skinwalkers. What I found was interesting but also unsettling. From the looks of it, the two skinwalkers stalked a group of kids playing with firecrackers on top of a hill. The track started at the base of a hill, and they went along a dirt road that ascended the hill. Both sets of tracks were small, and from afar, they looked like the tracks of two little kids. One set wore shoes. The other set was barefoot. The person with bare feet had great arches, not flat-footed, and wide feet. At the bottom of the hill, the person with bare feet walked at the edge of the road and made sure to stay hidden behind juniper trees. Where a wash cuts across the dirt road, the two cross the road and continue descending the hill, still staying on the edge of the road. About halfway up the hill, the tracks of the barefoot person changed into those of a dog. The way it did that was noteworthy. I found that the right footprint was human. The next left footprint was missing. Then there was another humanish footprint on the right, followed by a dog footprint two paces away on the left. From there on, it was dog footprints for a distance of five yards, after which it changed back to barefoot human footprints. When I studied the humanish footprint closely, the humanish footprint turned out to be half human and half dog. The heel portion of the footprint was human. However, the toes portion of the footprint was that of a big dog. Also, recall I said the barefoot person had great arches. In the half-human, half-dog footprint, there was a bone or something straight right where the arch should have been, connecting the pad of the dog's paw to the heel of the human's foot. When I realized that that footprint was made exactly while the person was shape-shifting, it sickened me. At the top of the hill, about 10 yards away from the kids, both footprints just vanished. I assume they either started flying or hopping around. Judging from their tracks, the kids frantically rushed out of there. They left all their trash behind, and they didn't bother to close the gate to their property. People normally lock their gates to keep cattle and firewood thieves off of their land. The fact that they left the gate wide open is unsettling.
I'm being followed by a skinwalker. So as the title says, I think me and my friend are being followed by a skinwalker. This started a few days ago. I don't know what we did, but ever since about three days ago, we've been noticing very odd things. Our truck started smelling like sulfur and rotten meat, and our trailer, which is very clean, smells like rotten meat as well. We don't have any meat here, we checked. We hear scratches at night while we're trying to sleep, as well as knocking, but that doesn't make sense because we are in the middle of nowhere in Utah, with no towns for at least 20 miles. There is also a Native American reservation literally 200 feet from our property. We decided to go looking for it last night. We walked about two miles from our truck and started to smell sulfur. Then we both saw a six or seven foot tall silhouette running towards us. We ran right back to the truck but it wouldn't start. Pretty cliche I know. I got out and went to the toolbox on the side, grabbed a wrench and started taking of the intake, sprayed some ether in and put the intake back on, and it fired up. Needless to say we peeled out. We were doing about 53 miles per hour to get back to our trailer when I look back and say that. That thing, is still behind us, and keeping up. I told my buddy to punch it because it's right behind us. He floored it but it wouldn't go any faster, it can usually do around 70 to 80 but I wouldn't go past 55, it's a Ford 6.9 ED with a turbo kit in case anyone was wondering. We eventually made it the mile or so back to our trailer, we shut the truck off and ran inside as fast as we could. We locked the door and covered all the windows with blankets. As soon as I got the last blanked up, there was something tugging at our door and trying to open it, so I went and held the door shut. Then out of nowhere the lock started to unlock itself. I tied it to the lock position with a boot lace, and grabbed a hammer, it's all I had to defend myself, and waited. About a minute later I get a text from a girl that I'm interested in, but she never texts me back, saying that she's in trouble and she needs us to come get her right now. I asked what was going on and she said she's getting kicked out of the house. So I get ready to go because this is my only chance with her. I asked her if she had money for diesel and she asked me why. I told her we were coming to get her and she then said why would I want to see you, we haven't talked in months. Um what? You just texted me three minutes ago. So I decided it was probably in our best interest to stay inside that night. I started hearing my name being called from outside by vaguely familiar voices but I couldn't quite recognize them. I never looked outside last night for fear that this thing was just outside the door. I put salt around the door because someone told me that would help, and nothing got in last night so it must have. So now we're here in the morning, there is almost no sign that anything happened last night. No scratch marks on the trailer, no dents, no footprints or paw prints, nothing. So here I am writing this and hoping someone believes me, because I need help. I don't know how to get rid of this thing. If you read this far, I just want to say thank you, and I will have another update tonight. To clarify, this post is not me trying to be a karma whore, this post is me saying I'm scared and don't know what to do. There are people saying that it's fake, but I'm just explaining the events that happen and asking for help. I appreciate those of you that are trying to help me and keep me safe. Unfortunately I cannot leave my property as I have nowhere else to go, but I am trying to take the necessary precautions to stay safe. I'm going to the gas station soon to buy salt to make a barrier around my trailer. Thanks for the help y'all. Again, feel free to downvote my post if you like, all I need is help. I understand all the skepticism, I really do, as I didn't think it was real. The thing that really shook me was when the door started to shake and began to unlock. Thanks for reading. Edit 2. Another thing that I forgot to mention. My flashlight did flicker on and off a few times. I don't know if that's paranormal or just the battery dying. Thought I should mention that edit 3, day 4, 
It's now night time and I haven't experienced anything yet today. I plan on keeping a whole log of what happens. The reason it says day 4, is because this whole thing started about 4 days ago. Even though it's dark, I really want to capture some video for everyone and that's exactly what I will be doing. I am not going to try to piss it off, but I'm going to be recording. Not sure how I'll upload it yet but I'll find a way and be back with an update. Thanks again to everyone that is genuinely trying to help me, because since listening to your advice I have had less experiences, but hell, that could just be because it was daytime. Also, side note, I went to the reservation today, but to no avail. Me and my buddy asked everyone that drove past where the tribe is and nobody knew, we might have to try again tomorrow. I wish I could just call them, but I don't know where I'd find their number. I'll be back with an update hopefully in a couple hours. Edit 4, Day 5, I listened to everyone's advice and made a salt barrier. There are also a lot of people saying that it's a demon, not a skinwalker, so I've been doing research on demons. I have found one very helpful thing. If you don't give it the power to mess with you, you won't get messed with. So I did exactly that last night. I didn't focus on it. In fact, y'all told me to pray, so I prayed. I didn't hear any knocking or scratching last night. No light flickering, nothing. Thank you to everyone that has come forward to help me fight off this entity, whatever it is. I don't think you guys understand how much you helped me, to stay calm, and to fight that thing off. Also, if I do have any more experiences, I will try to record it as well as communicate with it, using an if app. Not sure if the app works or not but I figure I might as well give it a try. Thanks again y'all. I'll be back with an update later. Edit 4 and most likely final update. No new occurrences. I still haven't gotten any help from the Rees, but I haven't had anything happen the last couple of days. Also we got a dog and it hasn't acted weird or anything the last couple days either. I think that whatever was bothering us is gone for good. I just want to say I'm so so glad I had y'all to help me through this, and to keep me calm. I may or may not give more updates but it all honestly just depends on what happens next. Wendigo? Skinwalker? Nature spirit? Okay so the only experience I ever had with a creature slash animal that I couldn't identify has been on my mind and a very vivid memory my whole life. After a dream tonight I think I found out what we encountered, a Wendigo. This is what happened. About 8 to 9 years ago when I was younger me and my friend went to hang out at a park close to his house. No one else was there only me and him and this was my first time being here. There was a small pond, a baseball diamond with a fence, a playground and it was all surrounded by deep woods. We live in eastern United States. We decided it would be fun to get giant branches and draw stuff in the baseball diamond afterwards we would bang the fence around it for like a couple minutes straight and it was pretty loud from what I can remember. We then heard wind but not usual wind but the sound of wind gusting through the forest behind the pond. This was during summer if I remember correctly and there was a lot of foliage so it was hard to see into the woods clearly. We then heard something big like horse size big but fast running through the woods right behind the pond but along it like it was running around it. I saw a big white creature seeming to be 7 to 8 feet tall and probably weighing at least 300 pounds. It sounded like a horse running but lighter. It was super fast I saw it through the pond weeds, it seemed to have fur but I couldn't see its legs, head or if it had a tail of knot there was was too many trees and plants in the way. We dropped our sticks and ran to his house which was in yelling distance terrified. We told his family of course they didn't believe us. I haven't talked to him in years and just messaged him today to see if he remembers. As for the dream I had last night I was buying old rare artifacts and art from this guy, showed me this opal slate. 
I picked it up and said hey this is my birthstone as I'm born in October. I saw what appeared to be a wolf engraved on each side but he said it was a Wendigo. I took a closer look and it was looked like a giant skinny pure white wolf but with a weird shaped elongated head. Scary looking really. And that was the dream. If you google Wendigo you will see exactly the creature I saw in the dream but without the antlers. Like spot on but all white. Is what I saw that day a Wendigo? Did we summon a Wendigo? Does anyone know anything about this creature or myth slash folklore? I didn't see the head or behind as a kid as I mentioned so it could have had antlers and a tail. Any thoughts or insight would be amazingly appreciated. I am of Navajo descent. I am one quarter, my grandfather is pure. This was quite a while ago, but every summer, we used to go and stay at my uncle's house. He has three floors and the basement was pretty much the living room and had a slope that went above ground, so it was only half underground, had windows and everything. So for some odd reason, they leave these huge windows open at night. I've seen skinwalkers snooping around pretty often, and mainly as distant silhouettes or six feet tall coyotes, could you just be normal? So I knew exactly what to expect when you voluntarily leave a window large enough for a person to easily climb through why? Let's go off on a bunny trail real quick. This situation already made me uncomfortable because of stories about when we were babies. My family was staying in my Nolly's trailer and she had those individual square locks and they woke up in the early dark hours of the next morning to find all the locks on the floor, the doors wide open, and my brother missing a lock of hair. My Nolly had to do some ritual or prayer or something like that to save him. It worked by the way, he grew up to be successful and is following his dreams. Back on track. So we were all getting ready for bed. My grandma sleeping on the couch, my brother and his friend sleeping on the other couch, and me and my aunt were sleeping on a mattress behind the couch that my grandma was on. Everyone else went camping outside to skinwalker hunt. Everyone got settled and went to bed and my aunt stole my pillow, unamused face. Around one or so, I woke up feeling uneasy. I sat up and looked around. Everything appeared normal and nothing was in the windows but the distant flashing lights that we see oh so often, does anyone have any idea why skinwalkers do that? And I went back to sleep. So here it happens. 4 AM. I roll on my left side to see my aunt sleeping peacefully, despite having rolled off our mattress. Her hair spread across the floor and she was completely wrapped up, cozy in her blanket everything normal. Until I realized that my aunt was on the right side of the bed. And whatever this is was not my aunt. This long black hair was not hers and her knee that was exposed was some sort of joint, I suppose, not human, nonetheless. You know how if you get greatly injured or afraid you either become incapacitated with fear or you fill with adrenaline? I filled with adrenaline. I reached my arm up and grabbed the couch and flipped myself over to the other side. I woke my grandma up in doing so, so I told her to stay awake, but to stay quiet, and it began to move around the couch and back out the window. It was so odd though, the way it moved so smoothly was kinda like the Heartless from Kingdom Hearts. Very snake-like. Some background. I live in a very religious place in the South so a lot of people tend not to believe what they hear slash see because it's just the devil playing tricks. That being said my cousin D who is about 12 years older than me believes in this too. That what he saw was just a demon and not a skinwalker. Getting this story out of him took a while. He didn't like to talk about it but I got him to open up about it a bit. This happened around the mid 90s. D, much like me and my cousins, spent his childhood around my mamma's property with his brother, C, 
and his cousin K they would play manhunt and tag and such like we did. When this story took place it was in the middle of the summer and he was around 12. He and C and K were playing at a treehouse that is no longer standing. They had just pulled a prank on K and were hiding from him in the treehouse. D and C stayed in the treehouse until K stopped looking. C left and went back into our mamma's house and left D alone. D stayed up in the treehouse and read some comics. The treehouse was about half a mile from the house and was on a hill so that you could still see the house from it, but it was still in the woods. At the time my papa was still alive but was in Georgia on a retreat so he was not there. Which let the three boys do whatever they wanted. Papa would holler for them to come in when it started to get dark, because there was, and still is, a large number of coyotes and bears around the house. D decided to read comics all day, something B still enjoys, and eventually fell asleep. He woke up and it was dusk he heard our mamma yelling for him and he began to get ready to leave. As he went down the ladder he heard a coyote yip and he climbed back up. At this point he began to get a little upset while telling me the story. He began to explain what the coyote looked like and I realized it was the same one that me and my cousins had seen growing up as well. It looked like it had mange, it had a large tuft of fur missing on its right side and you could see the bare, pale skin, and it had human-like eyes. It snarled at him and bore its teeth. He was taken aback by this and he just sat back down in the treehouse. The coyote sat at the base of the ladder and just looked up at him. He told me he sat there for about 20 minutes trying to figure out what to do. He remembered he had a slingshot and decided that the best course of action would be to try to scare it off with that. He said he shot at it and it just growled more. My cousin was and still is a very good shot with a slingshot I had a couple of bruises to prove it. He reared back and decided to aim at its eyes because he didn't like the way it stared at him. He reared back and got it right in its left eye it ran away yowling. D got a little more emotional now, he told me he climbed down the ladder and made a mad dash towards the house. About halfway to the house there is a large dip in the land where there are a bunch of bushes and small trees. When he was about there he told me that he heard coyote yips all around him and swore that a whole pack had come upon him. He just ran from it and while he was on his way up the other side of the dip he tripped and hurt his leg. D started to get upset and had to stop a few times, he told me he got up and started to limp towards the house. This is the part that gave me chills. He told me that he turned and looked behind him and saw not a coyote anymore but a person. And it looked like it had his face. He said it started to walk towards him in an odd way but luckily C and K started yelling for him and as quickly as it appeared it disappeared. D told C and K but they didn't believe him and they told him it was just a trick of the night. Something that he still tries to believe in. As soon as he told me this he asked me kindly not to ask him about it anymore as when he thinks about it he thinks he sees that coyote outside. D is a very religious and reliable man. So when he says weird stuff is happening I usually believe him. The coyote he saw that night me and my cousins have seen before as well, along with a stag. Since the night me and my cousins saw it, I have had two more encounters L the latest one being last year. I will share those in time. One of my cousins who was there with me that night has a reddit and may soon tell his perception of the events. I have some more stories that happen more in the park than on family land that I'm going to share soon. Several of my friends have had creepy experiences as well and if they are willing I may share theirs as well. Growing up my father was a minister and we traveled a lot. He was an evangelist and there was a story he told me when we lived in New Mexico. So he helped another minister on a Navajo reservation. The story went that the minister and another parishioner were out hunting because there was some wildlife that had been killing livestock etc. They ended up tracking what looked to be a wolf or something like it. 
As they are tracking it. Mind you it is getting later into the evening. They see something move. They take a shot and are sure they hit it. It ran away. As they continue on the notice the prints start to change they go from animal to what looks more like a man's footprints. They didn't find a body if I recall correctly human nor animal. Now it was not my own experience. And who knows it might have just been a story to try and scare me but I remember my father telling me that there are some people called skinwalkers that follow after some old Native American rituals. I remember at the time shrugging it off as nothing. The more I read and the more I hear of other accounts there is this nagging suspicion in the back of my mind that I cannot get rid of that there is a shred of truth in every story whether our perception is skewed or not. This is a narrative sent to us by someone who reads some of the posts and wanted to share an experience regarding the notorious Skinwalker Ranch. This person spent a few days last year in the area around Skinwalker Ranch, two of them trespassing in the ranch itself. To satisfy his slasher, we have no info regarding ID, curiosity about the legends around the place. With the History Channel doing a show on the subject, we thought it would be an interesting read for the sub. Once again, we stress that we put the account as is and we have no comment regarding the myths or the account below. All we can vouch for here is that this person was there per bits of his or her GPS journey tracking history and some LIDAR weather measurements output he provided and we compared it with historical data from the NOAA website. The equipment is obviously nothing like the professional weather stations in accuracy but they were sufficient for verification purposes because the stats were proportionally the same. The data point outputs, random non-consecutive waypoints, were given to us for verification, with the condition that we do not share it because this person was within the ranch illegally and does not want to get into trouble with the law. I want to start by telling readers that I do not advise or advocate trespassing into private property for any reason. I am really not that kind of person, but the curiosity was too much and I had just bought some new toys that were just begging to be used. I sort of feel a little bad about that part now, actually. Also I want to come clean and say I am not an experienced professional in the field or trained scientist, I'm just a university sophomore studying atmospheric physics, and much as I love my new gadgets they are hardly what NASA uses, so I wouldn't hold it against anyone if they think I'm talking out of my ass. But I did give mods some of the data I gathered in the trip to show that I at least did serious legwork and got on-site measurements. So basically my plan was to focus on environment info since that is my interest and what I know about the best. Plus it sounded logical that for UFO investigation, and that's the main legend about Skinwalker Ranch. If I run into any cattle mutilation or any of the other stuff I'll try to take pics and any clues I find. P.S. I didn't find any. Basically my trip, or hike where necessary, would be something like. 1. Start from a point 10 miles or so away from the ranch. 2. For two days I would take measurements following a path like a spiral towards the ranch. 3. If the coast is clear, spend a night in the ranch and see what happens and take measurements but get off the property in the morning so it's less likely I get caught. 4. Go back to ranch when sun goes down, still taking measurements the whole time. 5. Leave ranch at dawn again following spiral path away from the ranch for another day. So 5 days in all worth of atmospheric data around the ranch. Sorry I won't give you a detailed account of those 5 days, Again the less info I provide the less chance anyone can catch me lol. But I will summarize it and what interesting and strange things that happened. One thing that always bugged me about the investigations I saw on TV shows is how they would just dick around in the ranch. It's not really all that big, and if you're looking at whether you need a larger area to gather data that's useful. I was fairly sure that whatever they found as weird in the ranch was probably happening outside of it too if they looked, so that's way I mapped out the trip like I did going in and coming out and took down a lot of numbers. 
Now some unexpected stuff did happen that threw me off. I did not get abducted despite my best efforts. It wouldn't meet Hollywood standards for horror movies. But for a normal person who's outdoors a lot it was altogether so weird and abnormal that I almost just cut the whole thing short. There were times when birds would just either vanish or go mute. Without saying too much, I'm from a very similar environment and climate and that doesn't happen. Definitely not that time of year and most definitely not this strange pattern like they're playing red light. And I kept finding a lot of dead ones, some in groups, coyotes were acting nuts and way too bold. Twice and in places over 40 miles apart, so there's no way it's the same bunch, these aren't urban coyotes either, a pack was in my face. They weren't acting like predators hunting food, more like a coked up street gang looking for trouble. Not even the SUV scared them. In the first encounter, there was this one yapping BS who kept for some reason rearing up on his hind legs. My readings were frequently spiking all over the place. Like I said before, the tools were hardly military grade, but I did not think they were such cheap junk that they would malfunction that bad either. I also saw this a couple of times, still more than I would expect. I saw weird clouds. No, not flying saucers, I at least knew what these are. They are lenticular clouds forming up. Just clouds, but the number I saw in the trip is more than I thought I'd see my lifetime. This kept happening within and in the immediate vicinity of the ranch. I saw a dust devil. Yes, I know dust devils aren't a big deal, but I'm not used to seeing a whole bunch of them and just about evening starts specifically in a relatively small area. So after I got home and chilling for a couple of days getting urban again, I looked at the numbers. And I saw something that is peculiar but explains at least some of the weirdness I saw. The area the ranch is in at about an 8 mile radius, again, just looking inside the ranch is very uninformative, is almost like a mini climate surrounded by larger weather systems. The measurements of the area isn't remarkable by itself, it's only when you look at the bigger picture you see that a lot of the time, not always, but still a lot, it sits inside a different system or between two that are at opposite ends of the measurement scales. What I mean is that around its weather, there's other weathers that have higher and or lower temperatures, humidity, winds etc. that are also different as you go higher or lower off the ground. I won't show my data, like I said, but you don't need to. You can find this information online, and as an example there's this one. You can type in Skinwalker Ranch and fiddle with the data to see for yourself. I know I sound like a dork, but as I said before they at least explain some of things, like the UFO clouds and dust devil herds that I kept seeing. I was never good at explaining meteorology in words very well got a bad grade once because of that, so I made a quick diagram to explain how these differences in measures cause anomalies like lenticular clouds. I don't know much about birds, but this might explain the bird stuff too because what makes those clouds can also cause a lot of turbulence which can blow the birds off course or they might hit a plane that's also caught in turbulence or something. It can also explain why I kept seeing them in groups. The rest of the stuff I don't know how they happened or even if it is relevant to the above at all. I do know that environmental anomalies have a knockdown effect on other things, especially if they happen consistently over time. I let everyone make up their own minds. But even if what's going on in the atmosphere sort of explains some things, it's still strange. Why are these fluctuations happening? How do they change when the topography is not so different? There is some higher ground some distance away, but they're not that high. If nobody beats me to it, I'm hoping to do this again legitimately and make it my graduation thesis. I had an encounter with a skinwalker. I woke up to the sound of thunder, it was raining that night. And I heard knocking on my window and it sounded way far from heavy rain and I looked at the window and saw a fist draw back from it. This scared the living crap out of me. 
I knew a lot about skinwalkers but never had been attacked by one that night. How did this start? Well, I was talking to my dad on the highway at night about skinwalkers and he said if you say skinwalker too much they will come for you. They can hear you if they're in the same county. And then I said the word one last time then heard a roar that evolved into a high-pitched human-like scream. It happened last year. I'd like to share my Wendigo slash skinwalker experience. This happened about seven years ago when I was 16. This story requires a little bit of backstory so please bear with me for a second. My dad's side of the family lives in deep, deep southeast Texas. I'm talking like 100 people to a town deep. That being said, my cousin lives down there. My cousin grew up learning every single inch of the woods. Every sound, every smell, you get the point. He could hear an animal moving way off in the distance and tell you what it is without any hesitation. I want to preface this by saying I don't know what exactly this thing was, but the closest I could come up with it must have been either a Wendigo or a Skinwalker. Alright, so the night of the encounter. Me, my cousin, and my best friend all head into the woods. You know, dumb 16 year old. We all had shotguns, as we like to raccoon hunt, or just shoot at random stuff for fun. If you've ever been in a pine forest, you know there's pretty much no lighting from the moon when it gets dark, so we brought headlamps to be able to see where we were going. Eventually, we come upon a high bank of a creek. Probably about a 15 feet drop or so I'd say. You could almost say we were on a peninsula, the water flowed around the spot we were at in a U-shape. We decided to sit down, turn off our headlamps, and look up at the trees to see if we could see any stars. After sitting silently in the dark for about 15 minutes, my friend goes to turn on his headlamp. My cousin grabs his arm, and whispers to the both of us, there's something about 20 yards to our right, and it's moving towards us. I've never been more terrified in my life as when I listened, and heard heavy, bipedal footsteps making its way to us steadily. Like this thing wasn't searching, it was beelining. At this point, we all just freeze in place and listen. It reaches the bank on the other side of the peninsula, and without skipping a beat starts descending. We hear it enter the water, and eventually come to the other side of the creek. The side we were on. It starts scaling the drop off, effortlessly. This thing kept the same pace whether it was level, descending, in the water, or climbing. It's now only about 30 feet away or so at this point. My cousin whispers on the count of three, we all turn on our headlamps and shoot. One. The footsteps keep getting closer. Two. They're heavy. Heavier than any animal that would be in those woods. Three. We turn on our headlamps and, nothing. No sound of something scurrying away. No more footsteps. Nothing. We hightailed it out, with one person guarding the rear. What do you think? I'm convinced I almost had a deadly encounter? Am I crazy? My family is from a rural area in India. My mother lives a few states over because of her job and she was sharing stories since the area she lives in has a reputation for witchcraft and black magic stuffs. I was an atheist and didn't believe in paranormal until I got my blood sucked by a edek what they're called but they leave behind temporary bluish marks on where they've sucked the blood from and got really sick after but that's a story for another day sorry I am rambling I'm just experiencing so much emotions. There is this guy in my mother's town who by day seems normal, little slow at grasping what people are saying basically lower IQ than average person he moved into the town in search of domestic work to feed himself. A girl from the same home to one as his was my mother's colleague as well as neighbors. This guy would come as a dog or cat at night and scratch her doors, 
windows consecutively for three days until the girl decided to confront him the next morning. She told him to stop and that she knew it was him. From what my mother described, his expression changed and he walked away slowly while maintaining eye contact with the girl and giving her a sly smile. Later mom found out that he was kicked out of his town because they got to know he was one of those. I've always heard of the word skinwalker. So I just wanted to ask given by the experience above is he a skinwalker? I can't seem to wrap my head around it. My mother also said it is passed down to generations. I live near a very large, very popular national park. Locals here, like myself, are pretty aware of the goings on near here. Strange sounds, strange creatures, and strange disappearances. I have dealt with these myself in the past on hikes and even just relaxing in the park. Here is one that still freaks me out to this day. I was at my grandma's house that's deep in the boonies, the only road to there is a gravel road that is pretty much washed away so without a good car you're not getting out there anyways. My cousins lived in a trailer with their moms right below my grandma's. We played all sorts of games which mainly involved me getting chased, I was the youngest. My grandma was in the hospital with my aunt so our older cousin, who I'll name D, had to watch us. D was, and still is, the only cousin that's older than us that we still hold in high regards, he would mess with us and play around but actually cared about us. The whole day we spent playing around but we would usually play more at night. Like hide and seek, tag, etc. We had been playing pretty far away from the house and it was starting to get dark. We decided to go back to the house and grab flashlights and play manhunt. Of course I was the one being hunted. I ran pretty far into the woods on the other side of the property and hid behind a log. I heard my cousins getting close so I ran and they saw me. We ended up running to the very back of the property line, almost a mile from the house, and we saw my cousin D. He looked at us and kinda growled and we all ran from him, thinking it was a game. We ran back onto the gravel road and we saw him walk out of the tree line but he did weird, kinda gloatingly in a way. We ran into the house and decided to barricade the door to play a prank on him. We moved a couple of things in front of the door but decided to move the big coffee table in front of it too. As we loudly scooted the table across the floor, D came into the living room from the master bedroom running his eyes. We had obviously woke him up from all the movement and he was mad. We told him about seeing him chase us and he got wide-eyed. He told us to go to our bedroom and stay there. We sat in the bedroom for about 20 minutes and he came in and told us not to worry. That it was just him scaring us and we went on with the night. It wasn't until about three years later, when I was 13, that he told me the truth, it was a skinwalker. He told me that he has dealt with it when he was our age and told me a story, which I may share as well someday depending on how far this goes. This is of course just one story. There's loads more. Hi all. I'm not sure if this is the right place to post this but it's been freaking me out for the past few days since it's happened and I wanted to see if anyone had any advice. I want to start by saying that everything that I'm about to talk about is true and if you don't believe me, I'm sorry. I live in a woods in Northwest Ohio. My house is back about half a mile in the woods down a long driveway, and my property is surrounded by trees from each side except for the back which has a field that alternates soybeans and corn every year. We're a few minutes away from a very small village and about half an hour out from bigger towns. I just wanted to give some background into the area before I say what happened in case that helps at all. I've had weird stuff happen before, I've encountered what I think are not deers. Once there was one in my yard walking around apple trees, which isn't uncommon but the thing was huge and ugly and it just looked wrong. 
There was also one next to a country road I was driving down with my friend once. A few years ago I was dog sitting before I had a dog and I was out with the dog walking near the field and he turned around as there was a huge splash in our pond and started growling and howling. Other than that, the dog was really friendly and I'd never heard him growl before. I joked saying it was a frog man, like the Loveland frog man, but ignored it for the most part. Last year my family got a dog of our own and he's a hound dog so he chases and barks at everything, but sometimes he gets weird about the pond too, and he'll growl and howl at it. He doesn't really growl other than that. But the incident that I came here to talk about happened a few days ago. This year is a corn year in the field behind our house, which I always hate because I can't see out past the first couple rows and I've always thought it's creepy. Before crops are planted, I like to rock hound and metal detect in the field and surrounding fields so I know the land very well. I have found Native American artifacts in the field before too, and there's a couple wood scattered throughout the fields and a big creek runs through it too. I mainly stick to the field directly behind my house because I don't want to wander out too far, the farthest out I've gone is probably no more than a mile. A couple days ago I was out with my dog, walking along the line of dirt between the trees in the back of my property and the field, when my dog started growling at the corn. It obviously scared the hell out of me and I was yelling at him telling him to stop. When I was little we would get coyotes around there too, so I figured it was a coyote. Since I didn't want myself or my dog to get hurt by the coyote I started walking back to the house but my dog wasn't having it. He was pulling on the leash and baying and howling and losing his mind. He doesn't usually bay and howl like that unless he's treat a squirrel. So the fact that he was just screaming into the corn freaked me out. We started walking again and then I heard a cat meow from the corn. I was like, oh, okay, it's just a cat cool. But I have a cat, and there's plenty of barn cats that cross our property and my dog has never lost his mind over a cat like that before. So I keep tugging on his leash and I'm like dude let's go, you're freaking me out. And the cat keeps meowing and it's getting like uncomfortably loud for a cat meow, it sounded like it was a lot closer than it was. And then the cat started growling but it sounded like a big dog like big growls. Then the corn started rustling, bigger than what a cat could do. Luckily at that point I was just about back to my yard and the growling kind of developed into what sounded like a yell slash scream from a person. I was dragging my dog, my dog was growling, his hair on his back was sticking up, I was scared and shaking. It was absolutely terrifying. I went back into my house and told my family what happened and they were just like okay, cool, whatever but I was nearly in tears. It was scary. Again, I don't know if this is the right place to leave this story, so I'm sorry if it isn't, but those sounds have been replaying in my mind over and over and I'd love to get some explanation or something on whatever happened out there. Nothing like that has happened since, not that I want it to. But yeah, if anyone has any explanation or advice, please let me know. My experience on a first skinwalker sighting. So my family wanted to take a trip up to Kentucky around the London area and obviously it's in the country. It was me, my mom, my stepdad and my brother. We have an RV up there inside of an open barn. So it was around 9 at night and it was just me and my 10 month old German Shepherd in the RV at the time. The windows were very open and there was hardly any light. I was listening to music and remember hearing this loud distorted bark. Now we do have dogs but they never bark unless someone is pulling up. And we are out in the middle of nowhere so I thought it was them. This didn't sound like any of them. If they did see someone they would have not stoked. About 5 minutes later I look out the window because my dog stared for about 10 seconds and I see this bald pink faceless creature. It is way harder to describe than you think but it didn't look like human. 
It wasn't exactly facing me so I couldn't tell but it seemed interested in the goats that were in the barn. The next morning I was afraid of going outside and I look a picture of one of out dogs that looked like a skinwalker to me but I was just paranoid. I told my mom and she took it as a joke. Same with my brother so I came on here. I was scrolling through Horror Den of Misfits YouTube channel a while ago when I found a video describing what a skinwalker was and it genuinely reminded me of a creature that I've witnessed in the forest behind my house. There's been a weird deer-like creature that crawls around the forest at night. I used to go camping out in that forest with my girlfriend, but we'd always see a white-looking diseased deer that would crawl around the forest and now I'm convinced it is a skinwalker or a not deer. Any alternative explanations? I've been asking in other subreddits for help but nobody else has had an answer for me yet. It has white skin and I doubt it's an albino or anything. My girlfriend says they're angels in her native tongue. I was and still am never sure what it is. Here's the detailed story of my sighting. Hello, I live in the rural part of the US, in the woods, in a small home. I'm not too deep into the woods, Teresa town just half a mile from my home, and the driveway to my house is essentially a straight drive to this town. Why is this important? Because of what I'm going to speak of in this post. This may seem insane but I have been encountering a diseased deer within my woodland property. This deer has been alive for ATLE's three months, and I have seen it four or five times. My girlfriend however, claims to see it every day. Furthermore, she claims that this deer is an angel and that it whispers to her. At first when she said these things I assumed she was just teasing me, as in the past I had suggested it may be a skinwalker or other mythical creature. However she has quickly become obsessed with this creature. For example, two or three weeks ago we were eating dinner together at home. We were eating some cheap gas station hot dogs, as we were experiencing a major power outage and most restaurants were closed, and most of our food was spoiling. She suddenly looked out the window at the forest and became saying what amounted to I see it, I see the angel, it wants me close to it. She suddenly jumped up and ran outside. At this point I am freaking out. One of the people closest to me in my life has just proclaimed a completely insane statement and ran outside into the freezing night. I quickly shoved on my shoes and coat, with no socks on, and joined her outside. It must have taken me just a minute to get outside behind her, but she was already 30 feet away from me and into the forest. Keep in mind she's barefoot and wearing long pants and a sweater. I catch up to her and she's just staring into the forest. I asked her if she was okay and she just laughed it off and said oh I thought I saw that deer outside again, ha ha. About a minute later we were both back inside. This incident has been rolling around in my mind for a while, however I could have shrugged it off as her just being slightly paranoid about her angel deer she keeps seeing, or once again her teasing me. But just three days ago something happened that made me realize I cannot simply ignore her actions anymore. I wake up, for no apparent reason at 2 am at night. My beside is empty and my curtains undrawn. I'm tired so I don't think anything of it, just shift around. The second I got comfy and convinced myself she was just in the bathroom, despite hearing no noise, or taking a midnight walk, which we usually take together, I hear a scream outside. I jolt up and have the worst heart palpitation of my life. It's clearly my girlfriend screaming. I hop up and jolt outside with a speed higher than my heart's BPM. My girlfriend is laying outside nearly naked looking up at the sky pointing with one hand saying he's back, he's back. I am freaking out now, I literally started crying. I don't know why, I just started crying. The sight of her just laying there screaming at nothing made me so worried for her. I brought her back in crying and was debating calling mental health services. I didn't just want to go back to sleep and risk her doing something to herself and getting back up. 
but she's never had any mental health issues before this. The worst I know of is that she used to have panic attacks and went through an emo phase in college. But after weaning off of caffeine her panic attacks subsided. And besides the incident of her running outside that other night, she's never had any issues with mental health. So this is all a shock to me. The next morning, I stayed up all night talking to her. She just wanted to forget about everything, I asked her if she thought she needed therapy, she seemed confused about this. She said she was fine and was just stressed about our future and her career. From that day on, she's never mentioned the dear slash angel. Am I just being an overprotective boyfriend? If not, what steps should I take to ensure she's safe? I'm sorry for rambling and the strange timeline of events. I'm not a big internet user. If you couldn't tell update, sorry for not giving any updates on my previous posts. A snowstorm knocked out a power line for about a week, and I forgot I had read it for a bit there. However, I have another sighting to report. I was staring out the window, just blankly, no internet, girlfriend is away for the weekend, and I see something stir in the snow. It's that damn deer again. I just hobbled away and I was so spaced out. I kind of just jumped back in shock and ran outside. But it was too late, a hobbling deer outran me. How? It just disappeared virtually in front of me. I could say it was walking back into the forest, however it was walking towards my driveway. So at this point I am convinced this is not a diseased deer or anything. This is some paranormal creature or something messed up. I talked to my girlfriend about this and she just said it's my guardian angel and laughed it off. I must preface this with a few things. This encounter is second hand but was told to me on multiple occasions by the person that experienced this. I am a natural skeptic and cynic so I can't say I 100% believe it but his telling of it was pretty simple yet concise and did not vary between retellings. I've known this guy for many years and his advice and input on just about everything is well reasoned and always helpful so I'll just take his word on it even if with a grain of salt. Also keep in mind I am not a seasoned writer and past and present tense may get a little jumbled but I'll keep it clear and accurate as best I can. So let's get down to business. My friend, we'll call him Marv likes to go solitary camping on occasion to be one with nature and the things that go along with that. He is also an avid gun collector and enthusiast. I don't remember exactly when he said this took place but it was few years back and he decided to go camping on a whim. He packed his gear, a few guns, hunting rifle and .45 sidearm specifically, and headed out into the country onto a vast swatch of property owned by a friend of his. He had full permission and the works. This happened close to the Kasachi National Forest in South slash Central Louisiana. I won't be any more specific other than that. Safe to say it's miles and miles of forest and wilderness. He liked to hike in pretty deep and camp at a specific spot he found a few trips prior. These details are kind of sparse as it's not really the meat and potatoes to this encounter. So he made his way in and set up camp in his usual small clearing for the night. Skipping ahead a few hours it was now late afternoon when he heard leaves crunching and twigs being stepped on. He assumed it was an animal at first and got up from cooking something on the fire to try to get a look. He gazed in the direction of the noise and saw a man approaching through the trees a good many yards away. He has described his etiquette for dealing with other people in very remote places as always being cautious as more often than not people he comes across are armed like him. He tries to stay as friendly as possible but still keeps his guard up looking for any ulterior motives as you never can tell what some folks are up to out in the middle of nowhere. He'll make chit chat with them, find out generally what they're up to if he can and occasionally share a meal etc. He's never really met anyone nefarious as of yet other than this situation and maybe one other but that's a whole other ordeal. 
So one thing that sets off small alarm bells for him is he knows he's the only one with permission to be on this property and secondly this guy is not dressed for the location at all. He said the guy was wearing a white t-shirt, short blue jogging shorts, and white socks and sneakers. Mind you Marv is miles out in the middle of the woods away from any paths, roadways, houses, or anything really. Nobody is going to casually stroll into his current location dressed like that unless they are lost slash confused etc. It was early fall but not quite cool, very normal for Louisiana, so there's a ton of mosquitoes, ticks, and other insects aplenty. You're not going to have most of your skin exposed if you can help it deep in the woods. I know that all too well from personal experience myself. So Marv assumes something might be up and calls out hey there, do you need help or something? Pretty loud. Definitely loud enough to be heard. The guy keeps walking forward staring directly at him. Marv is starting to get unnerved and as I said I know this guy well and he's cool as cucumber in a tense situation. Getting more uneasy, as the guy is closing the distance, he gets to his feet and loudly declares hey man, can I help you with something or what? The guys is 15 to 20 feet away from Marv now standing at the edge of the clearing in the forest. The guy looking Marv dead in the eye, speaks, and clearly says help me. Marv said he was already starting to actually get worried at this point because he said the way the guy said this was as if something that didn't know exactly how to talk was saying help me or at least that's what he first thought. It did not sound right. The guy still unmoving says help me. Again slightly more emphatic but really just slightly louder. Marv said this is when he picked up on what was truly wrong about this. He said the timbre of the voice was more female and actually sounded like a recording being played back and that the guy's lip and mouth movements weren't matching up with the phrase. It's like he was just opening his mouth, emitting the phrase, and closing it again. Marv asked what do you need help with? Not daring to back up or move whatsoever. The guy still standing motionless as well still looking directly at him said help me again and repeated the phrase another three times slowly but not louder in volume. Marv now totally unsure of what the hell is going on interrupts the guy by barking alright you need to go now unless you actually need my help. Do you need my help or not? He continued loud and firm in tone. The guy didn't miss a beat and started up with the help me's again and made as if to take another step in Marv's direction. Marv told me that he then did the only thing that made sense in the moment and drew his .45 semi-auto pistol and pointed it at the guy telling him again you need to go. I don't care what you want. The guy starts to get more animated and agitated actually starting to say the phrase louder now over and over but not stepping closer or backing away. Marv did what he thought was right given his current predicament, assuming he was dealing with an unstable or potentially dangerous individual, and discharged a round into the ground in front of the guy. Now this is where it gets fully batshit crazy, I'm not kidding, as the guy stops uttering the phrase, goes silent, and still staring at Marv full on backflips slash somersaults, like gymnasts do, backwards into the woods and immediately out of sight. Yes you read that right, now I know what you're thinking because I had and still have the same reaction. That sounds like BS for sure but Marv gave no indication of falsehood and told me this multiple times each time in dead serious demeanor. Yet Marv said the guy back flipped away effortlessly as if pulled back by an unseen tension coil. He described it as completely humanly unnatural and totally out of place. The guy had just appeared and repeated the same phrase over and over eventually becoming almost frantic before Marv shot at the ground before him causing him slash it to flee. Marv said he stood there focused on the forest where the guy just flipped into and saw and heard no further movement. It was like the guy had never even been there. He stayed like this as the sun began to set and the normal night noises crept in. As I mentioned before Marv is a pretty unshakable fellow and actually stayed in the area for the night and next night before returning with no further incident. 
When he had told me and some other friends about this of course we asked many questions. We asked him to elaborate on the guy's speech sounds. He said the more he thought about it after the incident the more sure he was that it was definitely a female's voice coming from the guy. It was like he slash it had heard someone say this and mimicked it like a parrot or other talking bird would. Almost like a lure. He doesn't know what it wanted. He slash it, yay it might qualify as an it, didn't give any indication to follow or utter anything else. He slash it reacted immediately to the gunshot and you know what followed there. He has been back to the property since with no other strange occurrences. The only other minute detail that I can think of is he did remember hearing during the early morning of the first night what sounded like a gunshot off in the distance and it did sound eerily similar to his .45. He thought he may have heard it again on the hike back out. There are people that hunt in the area of course and it could have just been that. He couldn't be sure. Since this incident, and one other he had in a complete different location, he did some online research of the whole Kasachi area and found many legends, stories, and supposed encounters dealing with skinwalkers and other unnerving bits of Native American folklore in the area. Not to mention mimics and other similar supposed creatures. A lot of his encounter lines up with these tales but there's nothing tangible to prove it of course but even as a skeptic it does make me wonder about strange things in the remote and untouched areas of our world that can't be explained. So I can attempt to answer questions about this but I'm only going off what I was told so keep that in mind. I can potentially ask Marv about the ones I can't answer myself as I should be hanging out with him in a few days. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.